Hey guys and girls, um, today we're jumping on with uh, JD and we're going to kind of talk about what he does with uh, some tactical training and implementing uh, weightlifting with some of that. Oh, there he is, let's go ahead and get him joining. Quick. Hey man, how's it going? Hey, that's bad, Chris. How are you, bud? I'm good. I'm good. You're gonna have to let me know if uh, I start lagging or anything like that. My internet's been patchy the last couple of days for some reason. Yeah, mine's been this morning. Um, you know, we'll we'll make it work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cool. Um, so real quick, um, because you know, most of my uh, viewers and listeners are primarily in just the weightlifting field and you kind of do a crossover of strength and conditioning plus weightlifting so what exactly is kind of your background and uh then we can kind of get into what you're doing with like the tactical training and stuff like that too yeah um so uh i guess from the beginning i've always been an athlete i, mean, I played football baseball track powerlifting all those things in um, middle school high school um, i played at texas wesleyan university before i joined the air force for a little bit um, decided college wasn't for me the first round you know so <clears throat> um, i joined the air force in 2004 um, so i was in the air force for 10 years deployed a few times um, that's actually where i got more interested in strength conditioning as a as a profession um, cool. you know the if anybody's been in the military the the medical care system is is um, behind uh, the, the private medical care system, right? So uh, some of the treatments I got were ice and ibuprofen and rest when I was wearing 50 to 60 pounds of gear, running over <laughs> rough terrain, carrying, you know, you know, hours at a time out in the field. So <clears throat> it didn't really make sense. So, you know, I was like, hey, man, I'm an athlete. I can figure this out. Um, you know, so, so I started uh, going to classes for, for sports science and, and physical education, stuff like that. Um, ended up getting my bachelor's degree while I was enlisted from American Military University. Um, took classes online, took classes like sitting in a Humvee in the middle of the desert with the hot spot. Like, um, it, it was pretty interesting learning kinesiology that way, you know? Yeah, man, that's crazy. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, so I ended up being uh, one of the, the PT leaders for the, you know, physical training leaders for the unit, um, wrote the programs, helped my guys out, did a pretty good job of that, I think, you know, better than, than the average, you know, the average, the average military um, athlete, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. wants to do a ton of push-ups, sit-ups, run to pass the, the PT tests, and, yep. you know, that's not reflective of what, what soldiers or, or combat individuals, uh, so, you know, people carrying gear, things like that. that's not what they're doing, you know, they're not running two miles with with you know a pound of clothes on they're they're you know sprinting from location to location making decisions mm -hmm. under stress um things like that so um you know i lean on my, my athletic background my education do that and i realized that i uh, got to the point where the military you know it was it was great i was in for 10 years it wasn't for me so i decided to get out uh, went to tcu um to grad school mm -hmm. worked with the strength and conditioning program with the kinesiology program um, did a ton of research, learned a ton. Um, you know, just a couple of your athletes go to TCU. Or TCU so I met some yeah. of those so the guys there, um, like Adam and, <clears throat> and a few others. So mm -hmm. um, got really interested in weightlifting after I took my USAW Level 1 in 2014. Um, I was powerlifting at that point, going to USAPL Nationals a couple times. But, I mean, the totals were kind of low, so I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say I was great. But, um, you know, like squatting 550, deadlifting close 600, bench press like yeah. 315, 325. Like nothing crazy numbers, but. Um, yeah, but you had to put the work in to get to those yeah, numbers. Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. So, you know, yeah. I, I, like, I like the training process. And then um, the first time I did a snatch, I was like, man, this is, this is actually pretty cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, like putting, putting the weight overhead and, and, and those things, it's a little more. Um, interesting. So I knew I was never going to set a world record in, in, in powerlifting. So I shifted my focus a little bit and I realized that <clears throat> um, it, it, it gave me tools to, to train the physical qualities to a greater extent, you know, strength, power, mobility. Those things are maybe a little bit underlooked um, with mm -hmm. coaches who just do powerlifting. So yeah. that, that gave me new insight into, you know, new ways of thinking. And then, you know, I kind of learned more sprint technique and some of the more athletic um, you know, array within strength conditioning, not just powerlifting. So I think that's, that's helped me expand my horizon. And um, so, you know, with that background and I went and interned at the NSCA, I worked with their tactical program there when I was, uh, when I was an intern as well as, you know, all the other programs, just part of the intern, you get exposed to everyone. Um, yeah. 
And then uh, straight out of there, I got a job with the company I work for now, Reef Systems. Um, we're a contractor for the, for the government, and uh, we provide a strength conditioning service on that contract. And um, so my day job, I work within a, a, an Army battalion with a cavalry unit. And um, we're basically the, the, perform the performance experts, the, the strength and conditioning directors for, for, the, for the unit. So we, we write the programs, we educate the soldiers. It's a lot more intensive education than it would be with uh, like a collegiate strength and conditioning position. We have classes. Uh, we have an upcoming week-long um, leaders professional development course where we're going to go through everything from um, what is a strength and conditioning workout, what does it look like, why aren't we just running, all the way to, you know, uh, muscle physiology, anatomy, things like that. So... <clears throat> um, it's, it's, it's really rewarding and we're the, the, the military really likes what we're doing. We, we, for, so for example, um, I just moved to Fort bliss in El Paso from Fort drum uh, in upstate New York. Um, the first year that I was there with the full team, we had 10 coaches. Um, we reduced their, their profile rate or their injury rate, um, for greater than 30 days profiles that ran late, greater than 30 days. We reduced that about 60%. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's a, that's a huge number, um, as far yeah. as the, the dollar amount goes. So it's, it's over a thousand dollars a day that the army factors in for lost, uh, time wages, training, all those things for soldiers who can't deploy and do the job. So, um, I mean, you, you do, you do the math with, you know, four to 6,000 soldiers. That's, that's a huge increase yeah. in Absolutely. our decrease, I guess, in expenditure. So, um, that, I mean, that's basically, that's basically where I'm at now. Um, I do some contract management stuff as well for our company, but that's, you know, that's kind of business stuff. It's not really strength conditioning related. So, yeah. So, so this company that you work for, y'all work directly with, uh, all branches of military or is it, how does that work? It's divided up by contract. So we, we have contracts with Naval Special Warfare. We have some with the Air Force Special Operations Community. Um, we have this large contract with um, regular Army, so Army Force Com, just the, the regular mm -hmm. soldiers on the ground doing anything from uh, fixing tanks to cooking food to, you know, I work with the Cavalry Scouts, Infantry Soldiers. So um, depending on the award of the contract, we have, we have uh coaches in almost every realm of the military um except for the marines right now but there there are coaches yeah. with the marines with different companies so yeah 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 that's really cool man um <clears throat> so, so you said you kind of got into weightlifting in 2014 it couldn't have been long after that that i think i met you because i think you came out to one of our uh, weightlifting meets and competed it had to been like 2015 like here it was maybe 16. Yeah, I think I at that point had <laughs> decided I was going to do weightlifting like that Monday. And yeah. I saw that you guys had a weightlifting meet on Saturday. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I, I was like, hey, let me let me try this out. I, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to probably do anything great, but let me try it out. See what it's like. I knew weightlifting meets were a little bit different with the way the bars loaded, you know, with, with yeah. the lifts yeah, and everything. Yeah. So I just wanted to go and try it out, see if I liked it. Um, I really liked it. So. Um, I think I did 80, 81, 20, 91, 20 or something like that. My first meet, which is hey, not, not bad for your first meet. Not man. too bad. Right. Like I, I, yeah. I still, I'm still learning how to jerk properly. So at that point it was just kind of bend the knees and throw the bar overhead, you know? So yeah, yeah. It's usually where most people start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was good though. going into your first meet. <laughs> for sure. That's uh that's awesome, dude. Um, so, so with the tactical strength and conditioning stuff that you're doing, do y'all work in anything like the Olympic lifts or is it you, like, where's the, where's kind of that in, in place with what you're doing? Yeah. So, so we have, um, essentially, so the way I, every, every coach is a little bit different, of course, you know, um, mm -hmm. but the way I run it in a way, a lot of the coaches that I work with, um, it's basically, we have three basic, uh, uh, phases of the program. So we have, um, the, the supplemental like lower end where we have injured soldiers, or the brand new soldiers who never played a sport, not very athletic, can do limited number of push-ups, don't have a lot of relative strength. Um, so in, in that phase, um, we work a lot more with just working on the extensive exposure to um, range of motion, increasing tissue quality, getting everything prepped. A, it's our number one priority is, is keeping the soldiers healthy. So um, as much as I want them to be able to do like a, a proper power clean or whatever it is down the road, I need yeah. to make sure that their knees and their hips and all that stuff is strong to carry the loads and, and do those things. So um, it, it's, a, it's a lot of very basic stuff, pogo hops, lunges, mm -hmm. um, very simple goblet squats, right? Like we, like most of my guys, if, if we have a good grasp on the program and they have buy-in, 
Um, they're not even touching a, a bar for a, for a front squat until they can do 20 reps with 50% on a goblet squat with proper mm -hmm. technique and, you know, good clearance of movement, make sure everything is good to go. Um, because they're not barbell athletes, I don't need them at the end of the yeah. day in a front squat 315 pounds like I can get them strong and capable other ways <clears throat> so we make sure we do that and, and a lot of the soldiers we get have never played sports before um you know like th there's the the idea that there's you know the Navy SEALs and, and special operations and, and Green Berets and those guys are awesome they're amazing some people join the army because they need a job and they want health mm -hmm. benefits and they want a paycheck and they're, they want to serve the country but they're not, you know, 6'4", 250, running a 4'6", 40, yeah. and, and a, you know, five, four minute, five minute mile, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's phase one. And then phase two is, is probably 80% of what we do. Um, and that's the soldiers doing, you know, some variation of a front squat, maybe a back squat. Um, some of them will do, uh, my favorite exercise for them instead of Olympic lifts is, I call it a chicken jump, but it's the sumo goblet squat or sumo goblet jump um, with a yeah. kettlebell, right? Just soft touch on the ground, make sure we're working on tissue quality, make sure we're working on that reactive capability. Um, that, to me, is going to get them a lot more benefit than trying to learn a power clean front rack position mm -hmm. or overhead second pull and work on all those different variations. I just give them a kettlebell, tell them to jump, don't hit the ground hard with the kettlebell and float in the air as much as you can, be relaxed. Like, yeah. Amazing, right? And then we have our other end of the supplemental PT program, so our like, top 10% soldiers who are getting ready for ranger school or special forces selection, or some of the other advanced programs in the Army. Um, like at Fort Drum, I worked with the, um, the best ranger program. So those are uh, soldiers who have already gone through um, ranger school, and they're going to the, to the competition at Fort Bragg, um, or not Fort Bragg, um, Fort Benning, excuse me. And they're, they're competing against other Army rangers, and they're, they're doing like an intensive competition nonstop, task after task. Um, those guys, we're going to be using some of those advanced movements in order to, to build that that quality over volume once we get that capability built. But that's, that's very few and far between compared to the basic crawls and, and jumps and throws and things that we're doing. So we do a little bit, but I think the most is probably overhead squat. That's probably the most common movement that we're going to, mm. that we're going to use. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming you utilize that more for um, mobility, postural change, that kind of stuff, connective tissue work and things like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's familiar with, uh, with Yonda's or Jonda's upper cross, Yonda's upper cross syndrome, uh, tight sternocleidomastoid, tight, tight pecs, um, we got rounding in thoracic spine. We're just literally using A as a clearance tool with PVC or just hands overhead, see if we can get their hands up over their heads, like that's step one, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So if, if we can get there, that's going to clear up a lot of the injuries that we have because that's our primary concern. And then if we do progress to an overhead squat, it'll be in the first part of the workout, it'll be low volume build to high volume with maybe the bar, right? PVC mm -hmm. or the bar. And, you know, once they show capability, we'll let them progress. The soldiers have freedom to progress one step up, one step down of our model um, of the programs that we provide them. But at that point, you know, we're not going to put them in a compromised position just to get a 225 overhead squat when yeah. we could get the mobility that we need from the PVC or the barbell and then use the other easier movements or less stressful movements to, to drive those qualities that we need for sure. Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, <clears throat> there always seems to be like kind of this back and forth argument between um, some weightlifting coaches and strength and conditioning coaches because, you know, and, and I actually have the tendency to – to lean a little bit more towards understanding the strength and conditioning side where, you know, there's other, there's other ways to increase explosiveness and, uh, and, you know, load the body that, that isn't as risky as throwing a weight from the ground into the, you know, into an overhead squat position, like a snatch. Yeah. And then yeah. to me, there's also, there's, there's such a learning curve to, to getting to the point where you can even utilize that in a strength and conditioning aspect that it's almost a waste of time to try to spend if we've got to, if we got to spend a year teaching somebody how to properly snatch then it's almost could be like a year wasted in being able to make them more explosive because now on my end our goal is to be able to get them to snatch so we're going to to do that we're going to take the time to develop that but in strength and conditioning um the one that I hear most used is the hang power clean. And to me, I guess it makes sense because you can probably learn it a little bit quicker than anything else. There's a lot of power being developed from that position. Um, is, there, <clears throat> is there much, 
do you feel like there is a necessity to having weightlifting movements in a strength and conditioning program? Or do you think that it's something that can be very beneficial if given the time to be able to develop it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, so like think about a recipe, right? Um, we know we need, we know we need to make a stew. Um, if, if I don't live somewhere where beef's available and I, I need to make a beef stew, um, I can make elk, I can use whatever else that'll work. That'll, that'll, you know, get the same thing mm -hmm. done. Um, and I don't have to go drive to the store or where, you know, it, it that's kind of a, a lopsided example, but it's, it's, yeah. uh, what are the general qualities that we're trying to, to train, right? We need, um, so <clears throat> a, like athleticism, if we're trying to build athleticism, posture, position, and intent. Those are the three number one important things. So if you're out of position, if you don't have balance, or if you don't have the right intent, you're not going to be explosive no matter what movement you're doing, right? So yeah. I'm sure you've seen it, and I've seen it. I've highlighted it on my Instagram story several times. Um, the kind of pull and pray or the balance power clean that's prevalent in strength and conditioning. Um, I've seen strength and conditioning coaches spotting power cleans because the <laughs> athletes can't get into the, the proper front wrap position yeah. and things like that. So at that point, like, okay, so now we've, we've exposed two people to that load. Um, one of them doesn't have control of it. So that's an unsafe condition. Um, there, if you look at the, the pattern of performance, are, are they pushing through the ball of the foot? Um, are they extending the, from, you know, proximally to distally is, is the hip extending, is the knee extending, mm -hmm. is the ankle extending as a, as a secondary feature to those forceful extensions. Um, usually with a, a, an athlete, as you know, like when they first come in, they try to do what they see is, is, is proper for the movement, but the, that recruitment pattern is very inefficient. Um, yeah. it's much easier to give someone a medicine ball and just tell them, Hey, you see that car over there on the other side of the, of the parking lot, <laughs> throw it at that car. Right. And yeah. then if, if you give them a few coaching cues or you teach them balance, posture and position, um, it kind of self organizes the body's very good at self organizing tasks. Right. Like no one had to tell a caveman how to throw a stick at an object in order to hit it. Like they just did it. Right. Yeah. So the more complex the task is, the more time it's going to take to teach exactly. Like snatch is a very technique driven movement. Um, so it's going to take a long time to teach that. Like with my soldiers, a lot of these guys, I don't have the, I don't have a year, four years to get them ready. Like some of the athletes, yeah. you know, in the collegiate model or, or somewhere else. Um, I got soldiers coming in brand new out of basic training who can barely pass the army PT test. So run push-ups and sit-ups and the unit is expecting them to be able to ruck. So carry a load about 120 pounds, 12 to 15 kilometers, operate on target and then carry that load 12 to 15 kilometers back to where they came from. Um, I don't have time to teach them a power plan. I need yeah. to be able to get, yeah. get them structurally sound, teach them how to do things and kind of mitigate the chance of injury um, more so than I need to teach them how to be able to, to snatch a, a not impressive, you know, weightlifting number yeah. um, when I can have them jumping with weight and throwing things, sprinting, like sprinting, sprinting is completely undervalued. Even I think for weightlifters as well, um, yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. In, in the GPP phase, like the GPP phase, we can, we can, Get the, athlete, get the soldier out there, get the athlete out there, get the weightlifter out there, teach them um, very basic sprint mechanics, and they become more efficient athletes because their body is used to recruiting at a high level um, with, mm -hmm. that, with that hind brain intent. Like, they just switch off, relax, and go, right? Um, and that's yeah. what we want with our weightlifters. Once we get them comfortable, get into position, use your pre-setup routine, and then just do it. Don't worry about it. Just do it, right? It, it, the movements are too fast to think anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I think the you know, long story short, I think weightlifting awesome. If, if, if people can do it 100%, I think everyone should learn how to do some sort of variation of the lifts because they're fun, um, and they're yeah. effective, but if they can't, we can always find another way. And if you, if you can't do that, I think you're limiting yourself as a, as a coach. Yeah. So, so that being said, you, you just mentioned sprinting. What is something that you kind of from your side of this coming from strength and conditioning first into weightlifting, do you see that, um, because with weightlifting, we, we tend to have very limited amount of time to try to squeeze in as much as we can. Most of my athletes are only training four days a week for a couple hours at a time. So the program is mostly filled with uh, the lifts, squats and pulls, yeah. and then you know a little bit of accessory work. What do you think, uh, what type of movements from your side of it do you think weightlifters could really benefit from outside of that, that you think more weightlifting programs should be doing? 
Yeah. So, um, I mean, it, it, I think everyone should crawl. Everyone should throw. Mm -hmm. Everyone should sprint. Everyone should jump. Um, like those are those are foundational movements. I don't. I think they're non-negotiables. Um, it's just the extent and the volume, you know, that that's allowed yeah. for the time and the phase. We, you may they may go away a little bit. Um, but it doesn't take much to go and, and grab medicine ball after you do your, 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 your primary warm up. Um, grab medicine ball, throw it for a couple sets, do a couple of 10 meter sprints, and then um, do some bracing reinforcement with crawling or dragging, right? Like, <clears throat> those, I think those things are very important. Um, my weightlifters, they get some variation of those GPP movements almost year round because um, I think it helps build that resistance to stress. Like, it, it, you know, like if we only. If we're not Bulgarians, we're, we're not genetically gifted, and we're, we're not using those supplemental, um, you know, substances that, yeah. that allow that type of training. So if we're going all out with the snatch, the clean and jerk, and front squats or back squats or even heavy pulls all the time, the body um, needs to, to get stressed in different patterns from different directions at different velocities. <clears throat> um, so I think a lot of times some, some weightlifters, especially they have a limited athletic background, would benefit from a little bit more of an ex expanded GPP phase so they yeah. can build those general qualities um, to be more robust, more, more resistant to those, to those stressors. Weightlifting is very stressful on the body, right? Like we mm -hmm. all know that. So um, like to, to like I say volume 15%, maybe 15% of our program revolves around some sort of crawling, dragging, throwing, jumping, um, or you know, rotational, anti-rotation, rotation, um, exercises almost all the time, unless it's like two days out from a competition, because I want them to be able to a be comfortable with those positions, but use that as a, um, as a, to reduce the inhibition that is created from overusing the quads and the lower back and the traps and stuff like that. So, um, <clears throat> it's, it's I, in general, like throws, like grab the ball, squat down, throw it overhead. Right, that's a yeah. very explosive movement, high velocity, low low load. Um, that's a great yeah, warm up. Very, very recoverable. It's not like you can't Super throw easy. a bunch of that into the program and somebody's gonna be too beat up from it. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, what's what's more than zero? If you're not doing it, one set is more than zero sets, right? One rep is more than yeah. zero reps. So it doesn't have to be, you know, ten sets of three throws or whatever. Like, go out there and do two sets of three before you do your 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 weightlifting movements and you know maybe your your general proprioceptive qualities may increase just from being exposed to a, to a new movement something novel right yeah so so you you mentioned crawls and i'm assuming this is for um uh kind of basic bracing training for the for the body so you would implement crawls kind of as a warm up to start dialing in the the stability anti rotation and stuff like that um go ahead yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, we, we start with uh, just the basic, uh, that quadruped, six-point contact position, hands, mm -hmm. knees, and feet on the ground. Um, and then the progression from that, pull the knees off the ground, hold that four-point position, be able to resist rotation. So we may hook a band, do some perturbations, pull them left and right, <clears throat> or load the, the, the uh, lower back with a plate, make sure they, they have, you know, they're, they're not uh, anterior or, or posteriorly t tilting too much anyway, so we got a good neutral range. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then we turn that into a controlled crawl. Um, that, I mean, that's, that, those are great. Those, my soldiers do those all the time. Um, yeah, we turn like those, like we turn those crawls into, to crawls, to rolls. Um, so we'll do a seat roll left and right. Mm. We'll do forward rolls. We'll do backward rolls. Um, like it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting watching, uh, a 28 year old army ranger not willing to do a forward roll onto a gymnastics <laughs> mat. Um, because yeah. they've, they've never done it before, but they can set up, you know, landmines and, and things like that, you know, with, with zero hesitation. So, yeah, yeah, that's um, hilarious to me. Um, yeah, so no, we, we, I think that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, we, I either use those at the beginning, especially for, like, more developmental athletes. Mm -hmm. um, for our soldiers, we'll put those in as um, – to secondary or tertiary exercises paired with their main movement. So let's say they're doing a front squat. We'll take them after the front squat. They'll unrack it and go do um, do a crawl or, or some bracing movement, and then we'll do a mobility movement. So that way we keep everyone engaged. We have very large numbers. So um, like I, I work for 700 soldiers. We have two coaches. So um, we have large groups, limited equipment. Every, anyone who's been in the military knows you know equipment doesn't go a long way in the military. Yeah. So. Um, we'll maybe have four or five bars for a group of 30 or 40 soldiers. So, A, we'll have different people doing different things, but they'll have three or four exercises linked in a series with decreasing intensity 
Um, and then the crawls and other bracing movements will fit into there along with like uh, banded ankle mobilization or, you know, whatever, whatever we identify yeah. as a common point of, of concern. Yeah, I can, I can imagine ankles are probably a common concern for soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's, uh, that's cool. That's, uh, you know, locomotion is something that I've always really enjoyed and it's something that I've used in our programs a lot. And, uh, if anything, you know, some criticism that I would sometimes receive in my programming is that we're doing a lot of other variations of other exercises that aren't so specific to weightlifting. Um, but I just find in general that if my athletes are just more athletic all around, then we tend, to, they tend to get better at the, their lifts, um, but they also tend to recover a little bit better. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like, like you were saying earlier with the throws, it's very low intensity. Um, yeah. So like, like a lot of the soldiers ask me, hey, coach, like, what should I buy? Should I buy this foam roller? Or should I get this ball with the ice and the vibration and do this and that? And I'm like, <laughs> hey, like, how often do you like get on, just put on some shoes, go outside and walk around the block for 20 or 30 minutes and then just do some mobility, like actual mobility work. So like rolling isn't mobility yeah. work. I, I consider that mobility prep work. We're prepping the tissue to go through the ranges of motion with load and, and you know, build the volume or excuse me, build intensity um, or velocity, whatever it may be. Um, so like how often are you just getting up and doing something, taking an active role in that recovery? Um, just like literally walk around the block, do some crawls, do some of the banded mm -hmm. mobilizations, do body weight squat, do some push-ups, different push-up variations, a million push-up variations you can do. Yeah. It'll take 45 minutes, and that'll be the same amount of time that you rolled around on the ground or you did whatever you, else you did that, that wasn't active. Um, yeah. I, I think, that, like you said, and, and it's amazing. I know for myself, that was a game changer. Um, when I started doing those things, I do active recovery on my, on my non-training days. I, I prescribe that for all my weightlifters and even my soldiers. Um, when they do that, like, hey, coach, like, my back doesn't hurt anymore. Um, when I squat, yeah. I can actually, like, push hard now, like, you know, like one of the biggest breakthroughs with, with the military guys is you just have to try hard to push the weight fast and you can push heavier weights. Um, yeah. Oh, cause they're, they're like, it's, 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 uh, that culture is very bodybuilding centric for some reason or another. And they're on, you know, mind muscle connection and slow this. And like, yeah, those like control is great, but in order to be strong and powerful, you have to have the intent to accelerate the load. Yeah. Um, and then freeing up the tissues to be able to do that is made like it, it, it's like magic, you know, for them. And it's all it is. We're just increasing tissue quality, decreasing the inhibit, the positional dis, uh, inhibition and and allowing the body to do what it's supposed to do. So, yeah, sure. I like I like what you said there, though, because um, <clears throat> and I talked to my athletes about uh, the majoring in the minors where they're they're making sure that they get the, the newest mobility equipment and all the different types of tens units and they're making sure that they're doing but they're doing all that before they do the things that are going to have the largest impact on their recovery their increase in mobility which is going to first be like movement based yeah all right. you know, i mean we can get... yeah like okay you spent let's say they they bought the uh the new amino supplement and the new sleep i wouldn't even say sleep because i don't even go that far but the new pre-workout, the new amino drink, uh, new protein, a foam roller, and some bands, right? Cost $100. Um, did you hit your calorie goal for the day? Did you get enough carbohydrates? Are you eating <laughs> yeah. your protein every day? Are you getting routine feedings throughout the day? Did you drink enough water? How much did you sleep? Yeah. Okay, well, food's expensive. I get that a lot from my soldiers. Hey, coach, food's expensive. Well, if you didn't spend $90 at, at, the, at the supplement store, you could have bought a ton of chicken, rice, and vegetables and potatoes. Yeah. Like $90 is about what I spend a week on groceries, and I eat like 3,200 calories, to, you know, 28, 3,200 calories, depending on the day, of quality food, you know? And, and yeah. um, like you were saying, that's majoring, and like that's a, that's a very minuscule effect. It may be half of a percent. Like if you look at the statistics and, and things that, like, Look at the weightlifting world records since foam rolling has been um, – I think uh, Quinn Hannock from Ju Juggernaut brought this up on a podcast before. Look at the world records when foam rolling started becoming prevalent. They haven't really increased since then. Training yeah, is, yeah is, it, wasn't, it wasn't some magical you know, yeah. thing that everybody was missing out on back in the day. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it may help. Like, when I feel really beat up yeah. before, before a, a heavier session or before any session, if I feel really bad, I'm going to do a little bit of movement, a little bit more – foam rolling i'm gonna address those areas and i usually feel better um so like 
every tool is useful if you know what you're doing, but if yeah. you only have one tool, then, you know, if you only have a hammer, everything's like a nail, right? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and that's kind of what I explained to them. Like, there's a place for, you know, massage, for foam rolling, for tinge unit and all that kind of stuff. And all those things, if you can do them and do them on a regular basis and have time to do it, and you're doing all the other stuff on top of it, then yes, those, those little bits of percentages that you get from that can accumulate and be helpful. But if you're, you know, so worried about, you know, your, your pre-workouts and, and yeah, your, your protein afterwards and all this kind of stuff, but you're not just getting in quality food or the big one is, it's like sleep. That one yep. drives me crazy, man. When, when people complain about being beat up and overtrained and all this kind of stuff, and they're not trying to get at least eight hours of sleep. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not hearing. I'm like, you got to, you got to go there first. I was like, stop yeah. paying for the massages three times a week and just get eight hours of sleep first, and then we'll start adding some of that other stuff to it. Yeah, yeah sleep is a big pet peeve of mine. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, so if if we look at the like the phases of sleep, right? We need we need. So I think a lot of the research that's emerging um, is showing that the amount of sleep cycles within a, a kind of a confined uh, window of, of observation is kind of the most important part. So like if you're a shift worker and you can't get asleep because you have a kid and other things like on a routine basis, like consistent eight hours of sleep, if you do nap and you get a couple more REM cycles in within that 24 to 36 hour period, <clears throat> um, you know, it's not as as um, stressful on the body as just getting four hours mm -hmm. of staying awake and doing those things, right? That makes sense. Um, however, like if if you look at the 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 way the body processes in, or the brain processes information, um, the first couple hours of sleep is where we kind of identify your brain kind of identifies what's important from the day before, and then the second and third phases of sleep uh, are you know blocks of sleep into the you know six to eight hours is when um, it, it kind of takes those new memories, ties them in with the older memories, and it creates that more autonomic kind of <clears throat> reference to the, to the material, and it ties it to those, those other experiences. So if you're thinking about like learning new movements, if you don't get sleep, and a lot of motor learning studies have shown this, like if you don't get sleep, you can repeat the activity for a couple days pretty well, but if you don't do it and you come back three to four weeks later, so think about like right now, people aren't exposed yeah. to the equipment, they they haven't actually learned that that task because they can't perform it again two or three weeks down the road after that washout period happens right but yeah. people who sleep they they a their efficiency of the pattern gets better every day at like at 60 to 80 percent rate or something you know something like that um i reviewed that in grad school which is like four or five years ago so um <laughs> Everybody asked me for the name of the paper. I was like, man, I talked about it in school. Like, I can, I, it's on my computer. I can give it to you. But, yeah. Um, but, you know, so, so acutely, like on the short term basis, the um, motor learning is a lot more effective with sleep, but on a long term basis as well, right? So, um, if you're doing those things, like control the controllables, right? Coach, Coach Wood yeah. um, at TCU, one of the strength and conditioning coaches there, um, that's one of his big things control the controllables um that's that's uh it's very easy to sleep right you got to prioritize your time yeah so um you either have to a view it as a sacrifice giving up whatever's taking away your sleep or you just prioritize your outcomes like i want to be recovered for weightlifting tomorrow i need to be able to get my sleep so i need to front load my day with my activity make sure my things are done make a list prioritize my week so i'm not cramming everything into you know my before my big workout on friday or saturday um yeah. you know and and if, if you can do those things, you're prioritizing the outcome of being good at weightlifting or being recovered, giving yourself the ability to be prepared <clears throat> rather than, well, I know I got school. I know I got this. I know I got that. And then I'm just going to take a bunch of pre-workout inside. I've done this before. Um, pre-workout inside the iced coffee, down it. You feel energized and then you just throw the weight around for an hour and get frustrated and make a couple and throw them on, on Instagram. And then boom, you know, you're, you're, you're satisfied with yourself, but you're not that. Effective. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You right. got some good likes on uh, the, the two good lifts that you had this, that, that session. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, so, so with the, <clears throat> I don't know if you know, if you know much about this. So with the pre-workout and the caffeine and stuff like that, if people are training in the evenings, do you think they should be foregoing that? Um, I mean, yeah. So, so like, 
uh, the, you know, research shows that caffeine, you know, that the half of caffeine is about eight hours. So if, if you take caffeine, let's say at, at 4 p.m., I was about to say 1600, I used to military time. Because this, this is the exact conversation I have with my guys, because some yeah. of them will, will take pre-workout in the morning before PT at, at 6 a.m. Um, and then they'll take it again when they get off work at 5 or 6 p.m. So they can go do their bodybuilding, whatever, the, you know, whatever they want to do on their own. Um, so, you know, at that point, they've had 300 milligrams of caffeine at 6 p.m., um, you know, add eight hours to that. When is that caffeine wearing off? It's, it, it, it's not going to wear yeah. off any time, any reasonable time to go to bed, especially for my guys who have to get up at four or five in the morning. Right. Um, yeah. so yeah, then like, you're just in that loop of, you have to wake up and take your caffeine in mm -hmm. the evening. Yeah. Yeah. So with, with that, what I tell them is either, um, take the caffeine earlier in the day. So just take it at noon. So you feel awake and then it'll yeah. still be in your system. And what you're feeling is that, that upregulation or that that increase in um, you know arousal, physical arousal of the warm up process and moving quickly and doing those things, mm -hmm. um, that's what makes you feel more alert. Not just yeah. the not just the inhibition of dopamine and things like that from caffeine, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think they're giving too much credit to the to the pre workout and not for so much sure. to just their warm up and getting you know, getting prepped yeah. for their workout in general. And and that's why you know that's the supplements. Are, that's why um that nice and flush that tingling in the face and those other things mm -hmm. it's a it's a feedback tool to to to, to condition right like you know you ring yeah. the bell the dog's mouth salivates because every time you ring the bell you feed the dog right so yeah. um that that's um was that pavlov's dog right um yeah pavlov. so yeah so it, it is caffeine effective yeah research shows caffeine is really effective um <clears throat> but the a it's usually on time to exhaustion trials um, you do get increased force output at a certain extent, but for most individuals, that's going to be upwards of four to 600 milligrams of caffeine um, mm -hmm. to see that performance. And that, I mean, that's straight from the NSCA textbooks um, yeah. from, you know, for direct from the research paper. So if you're not taking that, that, you know, three grams per, per uh, kilogram of body weight um, or more, that's, are you really getting the benefit you think? And then if you are, you're not going to be able to sleep. So if you're prioritizing your outcome to be recovered, to train consistently, um, well, with my guys, my number, th my top three things, number one is to try hard. Number two is to try hard consistently. So if you can't try hard consistently because you're, you're over caffeinated and you can't sleep, then maybe you need to reorganize your priorities. Um, you know, if you can't train your training around, do that. If you have a job and you can't do that, then, you know, feeding your kids is probably more important than your snatch to a, a yeah. point <laughs> right so you got to go yeah, to work exactly you got to go to work so take caffeine at lunch and, and you feel energized throughout the day and just show up ready to go just, yeah. just be mentally resilient and know that you're going to be able to train with you know with or without it or just like i had to do with me because i got really dependent on caffeine especially being in the military working shift work long hours mm -hmm. um you know like just realize that the, the cumulative effect isn't worth it and just you like drink less coffee and make yourself more sensitive yeah. to it. So when you take it, it's more effective and then just train. Like, Yeah. Yeah. I try to, I try to explain to some of my athletes that, you know, especially those that don't come into the gym until six, 7 PM, you know, and they're still trying to hit their pre-workout before they get going. And I'm trying to remind them like, guys, this is training, mm -hmm. You're just training right now. You know, I don't need you to be at this like ridiculously like raging phase right now i was like save that for when you really need it you know it, yeah if you can take it earlier it's going to be in your system but you know if you need that that hit and that rush i'm like sure on game day i don't care yeah you know if, it, if we're going to a meet and you're lifting at <clears throat> 7 p.m i don't care if you take your 300 milligrams of caffeine at that point but on a wednesday when you're just getting prepared for some you know jerks and push presses i'm like just just back off, guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, if you're – so, you know, in training, um, if, you're, if you're ramping yourself up like competition every time, you're going to burn out, right? Like eventually yeah. you're not going to be able to sustain that over a week, over a month, over, you know, a whole training cycle. And then B, like if you're – if you have unrealistic goals and you're, you're, you're using that caffeine to amp yourself up to get a 10-kilo PR on a, on a snatch for competition to qualify for something – like maybe we should have relied more on training, nutrition, hydration, and yeah, sleep. Yeah. Those, you know, those are like four or five things versus the one thing that's caffeine that, you know, 
I know, like for me, if I have too much caffeine, I can't stand it right. Like I just, I just get too stimulated. Yeah. Um, my technique, I, I rush everything. So I know for me and all, some of the other guys I work with, like we need to be a lot more calm during training mm -hmm. and let the body just, you know, weightlifting has, a, especially compared to powerlifting and just general you know, bodybuilding, it has rhythm, timing. Um, you have to be collected. You have to be able to to um, put yourself in proper positions. It, it, you know, the, 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 the margin of error for a snatch is very small, right? Especially when, yeah. when the bar weighs more than you do, the mechanics change, it's much harder, right? So when we, when we get into those positions, um, you got to be controlled. Like, you know, yeah. like you, you can't be, it's not like a deadlift. You can't just pick it up, stand up, and, and hope that, you know, your spine doesn't pop out of your back because you got your belt on. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta yeah, be, absolutely. you gotta be in good positions and, and those, those tolerances yeah, you, are, are very small. Totally agree. You know, I would, when, uh, when I compete, you know, especially for like snatch, I needed to be very, very calm. So I wouldn't take leg trap slaps or anything like that. I would just kind of walk out there, let myself focus. <laughs> and then in clean, it was always the heavier lift. And so that's when I needed a yeah. little bit more of like that arousal. So then when I'd go for the clean and jerk, you know, prior to, I'd get the trap slaps, the leg slaps going out there because I knew at that point it was, one, it's not quite as technical. And, you know, at that point, technique was already pretty dialed in for me. Mm -hmm. But I had to get really kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more aroused for the weight that I was about to move because I was moving significantly more on the clean. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I definitely think that with there's, as an individual, you kind of have to learn how much to reel it in, how much, you know, what, what is the, what are we actually intending to do here? You know, are you about to go for a big lift and we got to really get you amped up or are you trying to hit your opener snatch and you need to go out there and focus? Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we got a couple uh, programming and technique questions that I wanted to hit and uh, get your take on it. Um, one, because I'm curious on where, where and when you would do this um, for, and, and this was coming from a weightlifter, so more specific to weightlifting, what would be kind of the ideal prescription for like heavy rack holds and uh, when to kind of implement that and what kind of told, this is kind of me going into my own uh, sidetrack, curious of what your, your information on this, what kind of toll can a heavy rack hold actually have on your body? as far as like the need to recover from it. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna address that second question first. Um, I know, cause I, I work with some of the soldiers who are pretty strong um, and you know, they wanna do weight so I'll help them with that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. it, like for me and for some of those guys who their strength isn't the limiting factor still, it, it's more technique and you know, routines of training. Um, if, if, they can, if they can front rack, um, you know, somewhere like 120 150 almost 200 percent of their max clean um the heavy front rack is going to take so much out of them that that they may be fatigued from it for for days you know for for yeah. almost yeah you know, i know for me um i went I, I was running an experiment specifically just on myself to see how long that would take um i think my heaviest was uh 620 on the on the, the front rack hold for a couple sets for like 10 15 seconds a piece and i felt wrecked for like 10 days um and what's that in relation to your uh clean um my max clean is is 160 so um, right around 350 okay, so, so it's, a, it's a huge number compared to my max clean yeah um, yeah you're pushing that 190 percent or something yeah yeah and my, my max front squat's about 425 or so um hovers around okay. there so <clears throat> hoping to get about a 200 kilo coming up after this next strength cycle but yeah, there uh, we go. you know that's that's a big number right that's 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 yeah. something to look forward to so um but yeah i i, I think that you know you got to look at the the individual's relative strength levels can like compared sorry, to sorry what was your what was your recovery on that um for me it was about 10 days for for some of the guys i was working with it was about a week or so um okay. and they were they were actually pushing it so you know they were doing 200 kilo um holds around because that was like 110 percent of their front squat 120 percent of their front squat um and they were still uh, inefficient with the with the lift so their their max was like 145 clean and jerk something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. um or so so 
you know, you got to look at the relationship between their max lift and what is actually considered a heavy front rack hold. So if, if we're trying to um, build postural endurance for, for or postural maybe just stability or familiarity for, for heavy jerks, then maybe we go, you know, plus 10% of that heavy jerk. Whatever your jerk max has, maybe go, you know, there. That's heavy um, compared to a jerk. Yeah. Um, so we need to look at where, what that comparison is compared to what the, the, the ability level is along with that absolute and relative strength level. So, um, <clears throat> you know, like, like we know, like loading a, loading a bigger, larger athlete, like 120 kilo athlete closer to their hundred percent is going to take more time for recovery because it's mm -hmm. more, more mass, more weight. And it's, it's just a bigger person. Right. Yeah. Um, and everyone knows like everyone over like 80 kilos and weightlifting is fat anyway. So. <laughs> um, you know, so it's just going to take them longer to recover, but the, the, you know, smaller people, smaller females, smaller males are going to recover a little bit faster. Usually that's, that's kind of what you see, but, um, <clears throat> so, you know, it, it I, I say it depends on those factors. And if you push the absolute load over what the capability is for the athlete, you know, for, for their lifts, their actual, you know, clean and jerk, then you're probably not going to see a lot of return on it. Right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so we got to look at why, why we do that. Um, and then, but if, if you want to introduce that, you know, once every month or so, and you're trying to push that strength, that may be something that you can do. We didn't push it for more than four weeks, um, you know, just to see what would happen. And they gave some feedback and then we adjust the program from there. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. um, like everything may work. You just have to run it long enough that, I mean, a lot of experiments, they don't work because mm -hmm. they're, they're shut off in eight weeks instead of 12 weeks. Right. So, yeah. um, it just depends on how you run it, but I, I think you should take that feedback and look at what the, the goal of the program is. Like if we're trying to peak for, for, um, for, for competition, we probably don't need to be doing front rack holds with 600 pounds, two weeks out from competition. If the, yeah. if the individual needs to work on technique more than they need to work on strength. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I always, I always have a tendency to program it, um, <clears throat> in relation to their jerk. Yep, And it's because of that, um, you know, little bit of that fear of if we overload this too much, they're not going to be recovered by the time we need to start moving something heavy again. So I can always find that if I have them doing either the holds or, or even just like heavy jerk dips mm -hmm. in that 105 to 110%, it's enough weight for them to get the feel. Because I think what they're usually looking for, you know, as weightlifters is the feeling of something heavy across their shoulders and not getting away from that exposure. That way, when we do get to the part of the program where all of a sudden we're doing 90 plus percent, they haven't gone a really long span without feeling that on their body. Yeah, and I, I've seen um, recently um, with West Kids, Dave Spitz is using some of that potentiation in, in the phase before. Um, they, were, they were doing um, power cleans or front squats or jerks, and they were holding that front rack position for, for five, seven seconds. Um, I, you know, I didn't time it, but it, you know, it wasn't any yeah. more than 10 seconds. <clears throat> um, and, and they were saying that, it, you know, getting used to supporting that load, getting that duration, um, versus loading West with something that he's not going to be lifting anyways, which, you know, increases fatigue. Yeah. He's a super powerful athlete. And as we know, like athletes who are higher on that type two range, they probably take a little bit longer to recover just because they're expending so yeah. much, so much resource to be able to do what they do at that, that high level. Um, <clears throat> so I use that, and then um, if, if you're, I know you're probably familiar with the, the relative intensity chart. Um, mm -hmm. I'll use the relative intensity chart in lieu of actual intensity. So if I want something to brush 90% intensity, I'll you know I'll get closer to a triple at 83, and then we're brushing that 90% um, instead of actually loading 90%. Then they're getting the feel, yeah. like you were saying, we're getting the feel, we're getting used to it, and then when we get to those percentages, they feel easier or they feel yeah. lighter, right? Um, the best thing in the world is hitting a good clean, being in a good position, you stand up and that jerk just is sitting there and you know you're gonna yeah. do it, right? Yeah, it's not just crushing you. <laughs> yeah, you can breathe, you can see, you don't pass out. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So. I, don't, I never knew how that felt. Um, every single clean was a, was a grind for me. Yeah. But coming from gymnastics, usually the jerk was always there. Oh, overhead yeah. was always significantly better than, you know, my lower body strength. Yeah, for sure. Um, so to, to touch the first part of that question, um, <clears throat> I think what I've been doing a lot with my guys is, is especially the last block that we just got done with, um, some post PAP, post potential, uh, pre-potentiation, post-activation potentiation, sorry, 
yeah, yeah. so complicated, man. Um, <clears throat> so we, we would do um, the lift interspersed with um, one or two pulls um, at 10% above whatever we were doing so that we weren't jumping. We weren't jumping from doing, you know, a double at 80% and then doing pulls at 105% because you can do a pull at 105% all day. Um, yeah. we're not doing, so we would do the double at 80, we would do a couple pulls at 90, go back down to 83% and do whatever we would do, go up to 93%, stay within that 10% range. Um, so I, I think that the front rack, um, I know, um, Travis, wait, 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 sorry, real, real quick. Yeah. You were doing the PAP, um, between by the overloading in the pull. Yeah. As opposed to doing like, uh, unracking heavyweight, re-racking it and then using, a lighter number for that. Yeah, so for the so let's say that's what we were doing for the snatch. So we would do a snatch double at eighty, and then we would do okay. a pull one or two, so a single or a double at, at ninety percent. And then if we were staying at eighty, we'd do eighty, or we would jump up to you know the next the next eighty three percent, whatever yeah, whatever yeah, the next yeah, thing okay. was. And then that that pull would stay at ten percent above, but no more than ten percent. <clears throat> and some of my guys who were more efficient, it was um, a little bit lower percentage, maybe seven eight percent. Yeah. Um, and then that was for the snatch. We don't do it for the clean. I don't do it for the clean because um, literally Travis Mesh said that it's too stressful. So um, mm -hmm. for my guys, yeah, I don't – Yeah, it more. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah I, that makes sense. So I haven't tried that yet because I didn't want to overload too many things at one time um, that first time we're running it. So it, it turned out pretty well for the snatch. Everybody's snatch looked really good. It worked great for improving efficiency in the pattern. <clears throat> um, the We have, a, you know, just my training – alone I, I felt more efficient more comfortable when i went down to those loads those challenging doubles like a double 85 percent it's not easy um yeah. especially with some fatigue on you and they felt really good really crisp um you know i could get a couple bonus sets or you know jump up two or three percent because i felt good you know instead of doing yeah. 100 i did 103 104 felt really good um and then in the jerk we would do jerk dips instead of just a hold mm -hmm. but i mean that's essentially a heavy hold because <clears throat> yeah. we're not we're not taking that jerk overhead so we would do one or two dips at you know seven ten percent um something like yeah. that but i think it's it's strong medicine so you don't want to use it too much uh, too mm -hmm. frequently too high volume <clears throat> and if you're more concerned with technique then get the technique solidified first because if you're doing heavy jerks with poor technique it's going to carry over to the jerk that you're going to do immediately after that right yeah yeah. So um, technique, as, as you know, Chris, technique is very important. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if, if your technique is not at least – like uh, what, what, what was Max Ada saying? Um, <clears throat> the, the, the air has to be consistent to be corrected, right? Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're not at least making yeah, yeah. the same error most of the time, if we're all over the place, like if anybody's ever gone to a gun range, if you're trying to zero in a site, if you're off to the right and down a little bit, that's easy to correct with the shot groups like this. If yeah. it looks like a shotgun shot it and you're, and you're shooting an AR-15, then I need, are you, like, are your eyes open? You know, are, yeah, are you yeah, using, exactly. Are, are you, the, yeah, that's, is, you know, that's you know, one are, of my, that's one of the things that can sometimes drive me crazy about coaches too, is that trying to coach and correct every single lift. I'm like, you got to watch and see what they do long enough and see what they're consistently having struggles with. And mm -hmm. sometimes a lot of those things are just they're not warmed up enough yet. They just were not focused on what they were doing yet. Don't give them all this information right yeah. away when they're not even going to be able to use it. Find out what they do consistently, focus on correcting that, and then let them work on that until that correction gets better. And then you just kind of progress that way. Yeah. And I think that's... that can be sometimes a, a scary – I think from athletes it's a little bit challenging because they're, they're wanting feedback. But as a coach, you just need to give enough to where it's eliciting a, a good change in what they're doing. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um, as, as an actively engaged coach who wants to help, like, it's very enticing to, hey, you need to fix this. Your foot's here. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're not bringing the knees through. You're not fully extending. You're overhead. You're, you know, this. And it's like, you just gave them seven cues, man. Like, it's a half yeah, second. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you can't do anything about that. Nothing's um, gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, hey, let's let's fix their balance first. Like, hey, start position the loft. Let's shift your balance forward two inches. See what happens. Half of those areas may clean themselves up, right? The body self organizes pretty well. So if you can fix balance, yeah. Um, like one of the one of the big so one of the big things that, that I hear a lot in strength and conditioning is, you know, you have to activate the muscles, right? Well, if the muscles weren't active, you 
you would be in a pile on the ground, right? Yeah, you would fall over. We have drives to, me crazy. We have to increase the degree of recruitment for sure. Yes, so absolutely. So if, if we get the joints in the right position and we have the right distribution of the weight over the foot and we have the right intent, the body's going to self-organize, right? Mm -hmm. you, don't have to, you don't have to think about using the, each individual muscle in the quad, the hamstrings, and the hip complex when you're sprinting. You just think, relax, go as fast as I can, and just it, it happens. It's kind of magic, right? Yeah, Absolutely after you drilled the fundamentals over and over and over. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where with my, with, with anyone I work with, like mastery of the basics, aggressive mastery of the basics is going to be primary with anything, right? Like, are you yeah. like, are you controlling the controls? Are you eating? Are you, you warming up? Like you were saying, you may not be warmed up enough. Did you just come in, grab the bar, throw it overhead a couple of times and then put the blues on? Like, yeah. Yeah. Your max is 80, man. Like let's chill out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see how let's see how the greens move. Let's see how the bar moves first. Right. Um, so it's uh, it, it's it's usually a lot simpler than than people make it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's it's that's kind of scary because you realize like there's only a few things that are important and the rest is you just doing them. So that accountability is on the individual. Like no matter how much you, Chris, want. Uh, I think Adam's still watching. No matter how much you want Adam to do the right thing um he still has to do it right yeah so if you yeah, care yeah. more than he does and he's not eating he's not sleeping um you can't do it for them so it's it's there's a lot of personal accountability especially in weightlifting which is you know at the end of the day there's absolutely. team there's team medals but it's an individual yeah, sport. yeah it's still an individual sport absolutely i mean you're on the platform by yourself <clears throat> it's you Your and the coach bar isn't even on the platform with you you know yeah and and i talk about that every now and then too where I think sometimes coaches take too much credit, <laughs> you know, and when, yeah. even when athletes come to me and they're like, you know, you did this, you really got me to this point. I'm like, no, 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 no. I can tell you what to do, but mm -hmm. you're the one that has to go do it. You're the one that has to practice it. You're the one that has to go on the competition, uh, competition platform and make the lift. So you did most of the work, you know, I've just helped you along the way. And I think some coaches take too much credit. And I think some athletes give too much credit to coaches sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I've heard that a lot with the, the conversation with uh, some of the, the, the European and the Asian uh, coaches and, and the, you know, their relationship with the athletes. Like they, it's, it's more of a partnership than it is like an authoritarian, especially at the more elite level. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, you know, the, the coach helps write the program, identify the errors, but it's, it's, it's 50%, like, not, you know, it's more the athlete than it is the coach, but it's, it's a partnership yeah. as far as responsibility goes. Like my responsibility is to be there and help you with the, the technical portions and provide the programming. Um, however, it's also your uh, responsibility as an athlete to give that feedback. Like, Hey, today feels bad. or This mm -hmm. feels bad. Or, you know, I didn't sleep last night. Oh, you didn't sleep. Okay. Let's, let's add some extra warm up and see how you feel and then go from there. Right. Like that's yeah. personal accountability. Or you can just come and I've seen it the other way as well. Like, oh, man, my coach's program sucks and this and that and this and that. And I may know that coach, and, and that's not the intent of their program. But it yeah. comes to the point where I can give you the program and I can explain it. But if you don't understand it and you're just going to be like, oh, well, I'll just do this instead or I'll just try it, then yeah, we got to take that personal responsibility. And that's any, that's like any kind of workplace anywhere. You're like, t take that time out and say, oh, hey, I didn't understand what you meant by, like, meet me over there at – you know, after work, like, yeah, did you mean, absolutely. like, where did you mean and at what time and bring what with me, you know? Um, yeah. And I think as coaches, we could probably do a better job of that sometimes as well. Like, hey, today we're like, we're doing triples, but we're, we're working on consistency. We're working on timing of the pull. Yeah, yeah. We're working on getting the elbows high and finishing in a good position. So let's do some muscle snatches because that's one of your problems, keeping the elbows high. So mm -hmm. let's work on keeping the elbows high and, and doing that um, versus, hey, you missed it out front. Yeah, yeah, I had a good conversation with another coach just recently, and uh, and we were talking about trying to stay like motivated during times of injury stuff like this. That's you know all the shutdowns going on, and something like that was something that he mentioned is having like intent goals mm -hmm. as opposed to just the numbers or anything like that. So the intent of this, and I think as coaches, like you were just saying, and something that I'll be practicing, is really making sure that they know the intent of every single exercise. Yeah. All right, front squats today, but the intent is perfect position, stand up at this speed, and all the above. I actually think we're going to get kicked off here in the next, like, 30 seconds. Okay, yeah. Um, so 
we should definitely do this again. I definitely have a few more questions for you and um, really enjoyed this. I think something, uh, I think implementing some of the, uh, the crawls back into the program, the pools and uh, trying to play around with a little bit more with, we've done some uh, post activation potentiation, but not really utilized it. I think as much as we could, I think after this conversation, that's something that I would like to kind of pull back into the program. So I'd love to jump back on sometime and pick your brain a little bit more, man. Yeah, for sure. Let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. And we got to think Pete's there saying thanks. So thanks for tuning in. <laughs> yeah. Pete. Yeah. All right. So. Um, I'll get this uh, posted and uh, we'll chat soon, man. Yeah. Sounds good. I appreciate it. All right. Later. Dude. Thank you.